So here we are, we're ready to begin this afternoon session. I mean, it's the opening of this afternoon session. We had a lot of food for thoughts this uh, morning, a great opening. I mean, uh, we are going into the afternoon session, Forgotten Territories, the toolbox, there will be a network coffee, there will be talk about when cities becomes a land of freedom, a very symbolic one, and over the playing field. But you have it on your agenda, and you can double check on the Delegate app. This is a forgotten territory, or maybe not. I mean, it's Lake Geneva seen from space, and the, the, the social innovation can come from unknown places. If you see your, seg, your flag down uh, in this image, you might discover that the European Space Agency is doing a call on uh, sport and space. There is also the Swiss flag, the Canadian flag, so the, it's really, I mean, uh, a, a celebration of not only Europeanness, but, you know, it's a forgotten territories that we often tend to uh, discharge, I mean, but it's interesting to see that also from space, there is interest in sport. On innovation, that's my thought, I mean, um, there is basically, I mean, if we look at sport organization, a willingness to engage in sports, but not enough concrete plan. And some of the plans will be discussed today. Uh, otherwise, we fall into the trap of changing, not changing at all, I mean, and then hoping that something magical will happen. So forgotten territories is social innovation through sports, an untapped source. I'm really glad that the silence has come down. So we are really ready, I mean, to listen what, uh, to what uh, the moderators and the speakers of the next session will have to tell us. So a round of applause, first of all, for the moderator of the session, Mia Salvemini, lead consultant at Two Circle. Mia, the floor is yours, please. Francesco. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and the morning sessions. Uh, so as Francesco said, we will be discussing social innovation and forgotten territories in this session. Again, my name is Mia Salvemini, and I work for Two Circles, a global sports agency based in Bern, or in London, or a few other cities. Uh, having worked in social responsibility for over the six years, um, primarily around football and social responsibility, I have now joined Two Circles this past spring, uh, working more on the marketing end, working on purpose-led partnerships, and trying to merge those two worlds closer together. Uh, so this afternoon, we're going to take a closer look at what is being done by different individuals, different groups, to use sport as a tool for social innovation, both in cities and in their surrounding areas. So joining in this, us in this discussion today, and I invite you to come up on the stage, are Arnaud Mouraud, Arnaud Mouraud uh, founding president of Play International, Amin Zariat, founder and president of Tibu Africa. <laughs> Lauren Kosher, senior manager of the youth sport team at the Greater London Authority. <laughs> and Lee Parker, senior programs and grants manager of Laurius's Sports for Good. Now, before I welcome our first speaker to join us, I'm going to have you all do a little exercise. Please close your eyes. Now, I invite you all to start reflecting on the question that is guiding today's session. Is social innovation through sport an untapped resource? Now, think about your hometown or the place that you currently live. Are there unused or abandoned spaces or structures? Where do people go to play? Are there sports facilities that are open and accessible to the public? Or are there barriers and restrictions that keep people from being active? Have you seen a place or a project somewhere else? Maybe you've already heard about one today, or you're going to hear about one soon. And you think, maybe we could start a program or something like that in my hometown. All right, you can open your eyes now. <laughs> Hopefully some images or thoughts came to mind, and I invite you to keep those with you as you listen to our speakers. Um, yes. 
So, now that your imaginations are alive and in motion, let's get into the brass tacks. How does one go about actually developing an idea into a working, functioning program? I think our speakers may give you some of those answers and hopefully inspire you to take the next steps. So our first speaker is Arnaud Muro of Play International. In 1999, Arnaud founded the NGO Play International, which he now chairs. He has also contributed to the development of many social businesses in France, especially in the field of handicap and employment. As a member of the French Olympic wrestling team for 10 years, and a graduate of the ESCP Business School, he has been involved in the social and humanitarian sector since he finished his studies. He is also global VP of Ashoka, the largest global network of social entrepreneurs, and he leads its Changemaker Companies initiative. Please welcome Arnaud Moreau. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? It's a pleasure to be here for, 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 for this panel, and especially for, for the topics that we'll be addressing today for two reasons. The, the first one is that, as you just said, um, I founded Play International 23 years ago already, uh, and I remember that at that point, when you, we were talking about using sports as a tool for development and peace, etc., in the world, most of the people I was speaking with were laughing. So I'm glad to see that 20 years later, uh, it's, it has become a serious topic, and that is, it's now really on the agenda of many international organizations uh, in, in the world. The second reason why I'm happy to be here is because as a, as a VP of Ashoka, this uh, global network of social entrepreneurs, we constantly talk about social innovation and what, is, uh, what can social innovation bring uh, to people on the ground, but also uh, to cities, to companies, uh, to governments. And we also see increasingly traction about this notion of social innovation. But because it's a bit abstract, you know, maybe I'm going to spend the first two to three minutes to really try to define what is social innovation so that we maybe have a bit of a framework that we can use for the conversation. And before that, maybe I, I just want to introduce briefly Play International, otherwise I would not be, be doing justice to the great teams that are doing a fantastic job on a daily basis. But what I wanted to show with this timeline is that Play International was founded back in 1999 during the Kosovo War, um, just because we had the, this deep belief that sports could be helpful anywhere in the world, in every type of situation, and it's not just something that you can use when the, you have a stabilized context, but as, that is equally interesting and powerful in context of wars. And then we, we try to really I would say, develop this notion of trying and learning by doing stuff on the field where we were not expected to, to, to be. So uh, after the, 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 the work in Kosovo, we moved to Afghanistan. We developed the first uh, programs for Afghan women. We had the opportunity then to move to, uh, uh, to, to South, uh, Southeastern Asia uh, after the, the, the tsunami and so on and so forth. What I wanted to share with that is that we were not expecting to be there, but we have learned so much that now we have become really experts in how sports can be used in those forgotten territories and where sport is absolutely not expected. In terms of overall impact, we have been, been able to and been lucky to, to reach out to one, more than one million children in the world since the beginning of this uh, inception of this organization. We have a number of partners, uh, a bit of everywhere, but again, that's easy to say 20 years after. Again, when we started, I can tell you that not a lot of people were really believing that sports could be uh, that useful. And the reason for that is because we were talking about social innovation already without really defining it. And, uh, and people were pro kind of sensing that sports could bring something. But when you were bringing together those two words, innovation and social, it was not really fitting together for a lot of people. And we had to explain what social innovation was. And this is what I'm trying to do in the next uh, two to three minutes. When we talk about forgotten territories, what is important is that we should really think about the issues and the problems that those forgotten territories have to face. They can be cities, they can be uh, countryside, they can be uh, many places in the world where basically you don't even have the basic infrastructure to practice sports, you don't have educators, you don't have a lot of the things that we are lucky to have in our cities. 
And uh, despite of that, there is a number of uh, issues that needs to be addressed. And I'm, I'm really focusing on this notion of issue because there is a definition of social innovation that, that basically says that social innovation is bringing an innovative solution to an unmet need, which is not satisfied either by the market or the public authorities. So that's a bit of a one official definition of, of, of social innovation. What is interesting is though that you have another uh, part of this definition that basically says that this is about bottom-up approaches, this is about being people-centric, and this is about being co-creating with people. So it's not something that you do alone and suddenly you have the fantastic idea to solve a big issue. No, it doesn't work that, that way. It's actually super complex and this is why we have been spending a lot of time at Play International, but I'm, I'm sure that my fellow colleagues here will also share their, their journeys in trying to convince that it can only work if we bring together alliances of people who are not coming from the same universities but can really work together. And this is probably the most difficult thing to, 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 to do, which is to create those consortiums, those uh, partnerships of people who basically don't come from the same place but need to co-create and build something all together. So when you look at those problems, and at Ashoka, when we look at the social entrepreneurs, what we very often do is that we listen how they describe the problem. We don't really listen how they describe the solution because we really want to make sure that those people are obsessed with the, the complexity of the problems they want to solve. We, they don't want just to solve the symptoms. They want to address the root causes of the issues. And some of those issues, you can find this on this slide, are things that we usually find in those forgotten territories. The, 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 the question is, how can we really address them in a scalable way, in a meaningful way, and in an impactful way? And how do we measure that? So what I would like to share um, with you now is what we found are the key principles of uh, fostering uh, social innovation on the ground. And I've put those four dimensions that I really want to, to share with you now. The first one is uh, the systemic approach. You cannot solve a complex issue if you don't really think about it in a systematic way. What are the root causes? How does that work? How is it, I would say, grounded in, in this particular society or geography? Understanding that is absolutely critical before any move, I would say. And this is why when you think about poverty, gender equity, a lot of health topics, etc., of course, sports can bring a fantastic element to that, but it cannot really deal with it alone. So you need to bring the other players that all together will be able to uh, provide, I would say, a sustainable and impactful solution. So thinking systematically is really important, and for that there is nothing better than talking with the end beneficiaries, the people who are basically benefiting from these partnerships or those who know better than you what needs to be done. And very often we don't really take the time to understand what they need, where they're coming from, and what we can do for them. So I think that this is really something which is critical to do. The second approach, which is a bit of the symmetric of what I just said, is to build multi-stakeholders alliances. It seems obvious this is a term that we constantly use, but actually when you look at the reality of the, most of the alliances that are built, they are not uh, multi-stakeholders, they are not cross-sectorials. They are really, most of the time, people peer up with people they know. So basically, they peer up with people from their industries. What about creating those cross-cutting uh, partnerships? It takes time, it takes to cultivate trust, it takes to cultivate, I would say, to get to know each other well and to, to know your own limits. And this is quite difficult. So that's why that brings me to the last two uh, aspects. The first one is the spirit. Social innovation cannot work if you don't change the way you think. You know, it's Einstein that was saying that you cannot solve a problem with the same brain that created it. It's exactly the same here. If you want social innovation to work, you need to change your, uh, your lenses. You need to look at the world differently and you need to be able to learn and fail constantly. As a former athlete, I can tell you that learning by uh, falling uh, is the best way to learn. And we all know that, so that's exactly the same here. We need to create spaces where we can test, we can learn, we can fail, and that's okay, you know? 
and, uh, and, we, and we try again and we try harder. So that's really something which is important, the spirit of never being satisfied. And that's why when you think about not just addressing the symptoms, but addressing the root causes, I can tell you that you are never done. You can always start again. You can always do better. And this is why the spirit is so important in this type of situations. The backbone for me is a bit of a strange word here, but there is a theory in what we call collective impact, uh, which has been developed, which is quite interesting in bringing different stakeholders together. And one of the things that the, this theory says is that when you have, when you create those partnerships, those cross-cutting uh, partnerships, etc., you need to have one organization whose job is to bring everyone together, whose job is really to be focused on the horizon, the meta goals that you are trying to achieve, and the, the assessment of the progress. You are not an operator, you are one of the, the, you are part of the consortium, but you are really dedicated to making sure that it works and it works well. So that's a bit of what I wanted to share in terms of what we see as the key principles of social innovation, and very briefly, because I think I'm already over time, um, the way we do it at Play International is that we have decided to create dedicated spaces where we can foster social innovation, where we bring together these different set of players coming from different sectors, and where we say, okay, how can we address with the help of the end beneficiaries these particular problems? And those problems differ from one city to the other. It's not the same in Kosovo than in Afghanistan or in Paris. But still, the process itself should remain the same. And we create those play labs, as we call them, or those safe spaces where we can bring people together, where we can learn, where we can fail together, and learn again, and try again. And concretely, it has allowed to, uh, us to really work on two examples that I wanted to briefly share with you. The first one is called how to uh, count, read, and write. So we are using sports in disadvantaged areas uh, in, in the, from the Paris suburbs, but also in Kosovo and other places and in Burundi, to help kids who are dropouts and don't know how to read, count, and write, to do it through sports, because sports can really sometimes alleviate some of the pressure they put themselves uh, on when they are sitting on the bench of a school. But when they are out there on the playground, they suddenly realize that they can do that if, we, if you provide the right methodology. But this could not be done without the teachers, without the educators, and without the people themselves. So this is one of the things that we have developed. Another one, which is a, most, a more uh, recent one, I would say is obviously linked to the, the war in Ukraine and the migration uh, that, we, that we saw. We decided to create with a number of federations in France to make sure that refugees people could be welcome in sports club. And so we work with a lot of uh, federations, a lot of sports clubs, a lot of cities to make this happen. And again, it seems obvious, but I can tell you that the first meeting that we had about that, we had totally divergent views of what should be done for refugee people. And guess what? There was not a refugee in the room. So we decided to shift uh, and to turn around the model in order to recreate something that was really uh, built bottom-up and based on the actual needs of the end populations. So that's what I wanted to share as an introductory, uh, I would say, speech, and I'm looking forward Thank to hearing much. my fellow colleagues react to this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, that was very interesting, and I think our next speaker will be able to build off of this um, very much from a local perspective from Morocco. We have... Uh, Amin Zariat. Through a comprehensive system that successfully brings together youth, parents, teachers, trainers, and the public and private sectors in the city, Amin Zariat of Tibu, Africa, is changing youth's self-image by institutionalizing sports as a means to achieve self-efficacy. Please welcome Amin Zariat. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this great event. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. I am former international basketball player. And uh, in 2010, I decided to stop 
my career and to create an event. In French, it's called uh, Tournoi T, International, I, International, B, Basketball, and the U, Universitaire, University. So Tibu Africa started as an event in 2010. In 2011, we decided with my colleagues to create an NGO, Tibu Morocco. And now it's become Tibu Africa with more than 135 people who are working every day to serve 250,000 beneficiaries. We work with girls in rural areas, we work with youth, neither education, improvement or training. We work also with migrants, refugees, with women, with kids with motion disabilities. And we give them a promise every day to become a life champions. And we offer for them programs focused on employability through sports, social entrepreneurship through sports, and also education through sports and girls and women empowerment through sports. We are based now in Morocco in 30 cities, uh, based in 12 regions, and also in Tunisia, Senegal, and Ivory Coast. And we have a vision by 2030 to become the locomotive of sport for development in Africa. Uh, let me share with you some, um, some key numbers. First, in Morocco, we have more than 2 million youth who are neither in education, employment, or training. They don't have a diploma, they don't have a job and they are passionate about sport, culture, other things. We have also more than 7,000 public primary schools uh, with 4 million kids aged between 6 to 12, 6, 12, and they don't do PE classes in primary schools. We have also 300, 320,000 kids who are leaving school every year. As an NGO, we uh, started a program, it's called School of Second Chance. School of Second Chance, first, we have a great partnership with the Minister of National Education. We, uh, through this partnership, we have uh, some schools who are closed for 10 years ago, and we built everything from scratch, classes, and uh, basketball fields, football, football fields, incubator, et cetera, et cetera. And we hire youth who are in need situation, neither education, employment, nor training, and we offer for them a program focused on sports, school, and enterprise. First, they are very passionate about sport, surf, yoga, judo, sambo, volleyball, etc. And they come to the school of Second Chance. They follow a program focused on how they can be sports coach. They learn French, English, Spanish. They learn also Microsoft tools, digital tools. And they uh, follow also classes focused on entrepreneurship, on marketing digital, etc. And in the same time, they go to a Decathlon store for uh, professional experiences. They go to a Nike store. They go to uh, club uh, associations, etc. And after one year, they become uh, they develop many skills, and also they become coaches, or they become. Um, sports coaches, sport health facilitators, sports instructors, and also they can become sports entrepreneurs. In this school, we, we have more than uh, 10 schools now in, in, uh, in Morocco, and we have one school in Abobo, in Ivory Coast, and another one in Senegal, and we are also working to have uh, uh, two schools in Tunisia. And this school uh, offer uh, every year uh, for 100 uh, uh, youth uh, who are in need situation, the, the opportunity to follow this program. But we, we have like a, a concept of open school because uh, we have a lot of facilities in the school, so we, can, we give an opportunity for kids to come to play uh, football, to learn also STEM, STEM science, technology, engineering, and math. Through, 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 through sports. We, most of our schools, they are located in poor neighborhoods, so uh, we open the school also for um, women. We have a program, it's called Mama Fit. Mama Fit, we give the opportunity for women uh, to uh, 
play, uh, to have a fitness uh, program, but also to learn yoga. But also most of them, they, they have like a small job. They, 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 they sell cakes, etc. And we help them how they can develop their revenues. Um, this school are um, very dynamic because, for example, in Agadir, in the south of Morocco, classes start at seven because in the south of Morocco, we uh, have a good beaches and uh, we are focusing on surfing, kite surfing and bodyboard. So the classes start at 7 a.m. and they start with a practice surfing or bodyboard. And in the same time, they learn how they can uh, um, converge between sport and uh, 17 sustainable goals of development. And they start uh, classes uh, at 10 and they finish uh, with an internship or a professional experiences at 3 p.m. every day in one hotel or a sports complex uh, to, to develop their uh, competencies. In other cities uh, of Morocco, the system is different and uh, we adapt the curriculum um, uh, related to the, to the region. Uh, we have a, a target for 2026 to, uh, to have more than 20 schools of second chance. And now we are working with the Minister of National Education and with the, also uh, some stakeholders to, 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 to have this uh, target. The second, uh, the second uh, thing, uh, we have a program focused on education through sports. So in these schools, but also in other primary schools, as I told you in the beginning, we don't have PE classes in our country for public, pu public primary schools. So we started a program, it's called Generation Sportive, Sports Generation, and uh, we uh, give to, we offer for each school a, a teacher, who is, um, who is an alumni of our School of Second Chance. And he developed a program focused on sports and health, through, uh, education and health through sports. And uh, it's, um, it's a program, we have a target by 2026 to reach more than 4 million kids to have uh, this program. Last but not least, we uh, have another program uh, located or based in the schools of Second Chance. It's called uh, Sports Social Innovation Lab. We uh, work with youth who are very passionate about sport to develop their mi entrepreneurial mindset. And we support them for six months to um, have more idea about what is a social innovation, what is a so sports startups, what is a business model, etc., And we support them to launch uh, startups focused on sports and health, sports and education, sports and new, new technologies, and sports and environment. And uh, we have now more than 700 youth who now have their startups and they are um, uh, they are also generating revenues, but also they are creating jobs. Uh, let me share with you a slide about our um, objectives or target by 2026. And uh, yeah, uh, it started from, uh, from a tournament and now it's uh, NGO who are impacting uh, more than 250,000 beneficiaries, 4 million by 2026, and we have a vision by 2030. So as uh, Arno said, yeah, social innovation can be converted with uh, sports, definitely. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions for everyone after this. I definitely have some. So thank you, Amin. So. Moving on to our next speakers, coming from the City of London, we have Lauren Kosher. Lauren is Senior Manager of the Youth Sport Team at the Greater London Authority. On behalf of the Mayor of London, Lauren's team delivers sport for social outcomes to underserved young Londoners through grant funding and targeted investment with partners such as the NFL, Comic Relief, Sport England, London Marathon, and Laureus. She has worked in the nonprofit and youth sectors for over 20 years, both internationally and focused in the UK, and is a project, man project management consultant and trainer for nonprofit and voluntary organizations. Welcome, Lauren. Uh, 
Hi. Ah, thank you. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name's Lauren. I manage the sport team at the Greater London Authority. I'm going to talk to you about our Sport Unites programme, which my team manage on behalf of the Mayor of London. So at the GLA, our remit is um, anywhere within the M25. If you've been to London, you will know that that's quite a, a large area. It's huge, it's densely populated. There's 33 boroughs with nearly 9 million people. All of those people, all of those communities have different needs and different access to facilities. So for us, it's essential to be innovative in the way that we reach and engage Londoners in both urban and suburban areas. I'll start with a little bit of background uh, to Sport Unites. So following the London 2012 Olympics, the previous mayor wanted to harness the power of such a huge and uniting event in the capital. The focus then was on outputs through participation and engagement in sport. But the Sport Unites programme delivers against the current mayor's uh, sport strategy and moves away from simply increasing participation in sport to focusing on sport for social outcomes. Sport Unites is delivered in two phases, so 2018 to 21. Um, during this period, the focus one was on using sport and physical activity to tackle those five key social issues in London. For phase two, which we're currently in, so from 2022 to 25, we had a bit of a refocus because of COVID. Um, that's meant that we now support the provision uh, specifically for underserved young people. So that's where we think of forgotten territories. Um, the programme now also has a focus on London's COVID recovery missions. This means building stronger communities and supporting young people through quality mentoring alongside the original Mayor's strategy for sport. The idea being that all Londoners are able to play an active role in their communities, making London a more equal and inclusive city post-COVID-19. So these are our current themes um, for the Sport Unites programme. We also have a second aim, which is supporting the sector. Um, and we focus on supporting the community sports sector workforce by upskilling, thought leadership, research and policy, and capacity building. So we have uh, a couple of big programs under each of those aims, um, and I'll go into them a little, in a little bit more detail. So our first aim is supporting Londoners. And firstly, under this aim, uh, is our new, brand new, very exciting, uh, Sport Collaborative Young People's Fund. It needs a snappier name. We are going to come up with a snappier name, I promise. Um, but the point of the fund is to be innovative and collaborative, um, particularly as funders. This is something that a lot of funders are not very good at often. So we're trying to bring funders together. We're trying to be more collaborative in the way that we provide um, support to um, community organisations. So this is in collaboration with Sport England and the London Marathon Charitable Trust. It's 17 million pounds over five years, but we have plans to continue to expand that. What's important here is we're outcome driven, not outputs, very much outcome driven. For underserved young Londoners, we want to help build a fairer London by transforming lives uh, through sport and physical activity. We want to strengthen, diversify and enhance the sustainability of the capital's sport and physical activity sector so that it better meets their needs. And we want to reduce barriers to physical activity to tackle the social economic inequalities uh, to ensure that those young people can fulfil their potential. Importantly for us, the partnership is not merely a funding vehicle. By coming together, combining effort, insight and expertise, the partners will simplify the capital sporting landscape um, and ideally have a significantly greater impact than if we were working alone. The other element in our supporting Londoners aim is targeted investment. So I'm going to show you some of the projects that we're working on at the moment with our key partners in areas that we want to work together to focus on a specific outcome or a specific target group. Uh, we work with a range of partners and a range of sports to make sure that we as a city are meeting all of the elements of the Mayor's Sports Strategy and Recovery Missions. So, for example, we have a partnership with the NFL Foundation to deliver NFL flag football through community organisations. Uh, but this project also develops youth advocacy, social connectivity and reduces physical and mental well-being inequalities. We have a partnership with the NBA um, and Basketball England to create a managed network of development, development, training and deployment opportunities for 500 new young coaches. 
We work with London's Violence Reduction Unit uh, using sport to tackle, tackle serious youth violence. We have a Clink to Club project, uh, which is one of my personal favourites. Uh, it's delivered in prisons um, using boxing workshops and a link to a local sports club in order to provide support and mentoring to young women and men to reach their needs and their goals following incarceration. And we also currently work with the London Youth Games on their disability inclusion project um, to allow young people with disabilities uh, to access additional opportunities when engaging with the games. So these projects serve to better support all young Londoners in urban and suburban areas. Um, through Sport Unites, we deliver as much as possible in all London boroughs, ensuring that those in suburban areas don't miss out. But we have two specific projects which directly focus in those areas. One of those I wanted to highlight is Model City. I'm not going to go into loads of detail because Lee is actually going to talk a lot about Model City, so I'm going to take a step back because he, he's the expert. Um, but for us at Sport Unite, this is a really big and important part of our program. Um, it's a unique project. It allows community-led, place-based approaches to sport provision. So the project in, Mod in London um, supports resident-led coalitions in Barking, Hounslow and Haringey to implement strategies for the use of sport to benefit local young people and tackle social integration challenges. These locations in particular uh, were determined to be among the least socially integrated areas in London, and they are all in outer London. Um, the next project is Open Doors. Um, so the Open Doors project aims to unlock school facilities during school holiday periods. Um, so it Open Doors provides coaching, mentoring and support to young people, ensuring that they have access to local role models, local delivery and enriching engagement in safe and familiar spaces. It focuses on supporting the most at-risk young people, so may, they may be at risk of exclusion or have already been excluded from school. They may be at risk of crime. Um, by using underutilised school facilities uh, as community hubs, Open Doors makes sure that when term time ends, engagement for vulnerable young people doesn't end. And that's why it's really important to us. So Open Doors and Model City in particular are projects that we currently run in the more suburban areas of London, um, allowing those who otherwise may not have access to funding or facilities the opportunity to be involved in sport for social outcomes. And then our second aim uh, is just as important, and that's supporting the sector. And as the GLA, we have a really key role to play here. We bring funders and grassroots organisations together. We provide thought leadership and we provide communities of learning. Um, so as part of this, we have our Sport for Serious Youth Violence Steering Group. Uh, this is made up of organisations and their young people who come together to steer us in the right direction um, and make decisions for us when we're uh, looking at projects in relation to serious youth violence. They also design their own projects um, and tell us where we should be focusing our work. So through this, uh, the steering group have developed an internship and apprenticeship programme, working with national governing bodies to improve the diversity of their workforce. And we're currently delivering this with Basketball England and England Boxing. We're also uh, developing projects to better support the community sports sector workforce. You might all have found in the last few years that many sport coaches now also need to understand how to be mentors. They need to understand how to support young people's mental health, how to spot mental health issues, how to deliver trauma-informed uh, projects, um, and how to work with young people from diverse backgrounds. So for us, it's really important that we look at ways that we can better upskill the community sports sector workforce um, through a package of support from workshops to trainings to one-to-one -to -one support and accreditations. Uh, we also have organisational development embedded in all of our projects so we can support organisations to build their capacity, learn from each other and become more sustainable. And then lastly, nearly there, um, research and policy is really important to us to make sure that we're using research to properly inform all the work that we do. We are currently delivering a participatory grant making um, approach because it's become very clear to us that funding rounds from funders like ourselves are not fairly balanced. Um, we need to support all organisations, all community leaders to be able to access funding rather than it always being the same players who have capacity and the knowledge to fill out funding applications. 
So the idea being that this shapes an effective and equitable grant model, um, allowing a level playing field and greater community engagement and therefore more effectively supporting Londoners. So I just wanted to finish um, by highlighting what I mentioned at the start. We, we work with a population of nearly 9 million diverse people. As civil servants, we are responsible for making sure that all Londoners firstly get what they voted for, so we honour the Mayor's manifesto commitments, but also that all Londoners have the same opportunities and the same access. With sport, we need to be creative, we need to be innovative, we need to bring different sports to the community and make them accessible. And at the same time, we would be remiss to think that sport stops at participation. There is so much more that sport can do for a person and a community, and that's the mission behind Sport Unites. Thanks. That was excellent and a great segue into our final speakers. So, first of all, I have to apologize because we do have one additional speaker. She's joining us online. Uh, her name is Renu and she's joining us from India, joining Lee Parker as well. So, Lee is a sport for development specialist with over 10 years in working in community-based intervention through sports. He heads up Laureus for Sport for Goods <coughs> place-based community-led initiative called Sport for Good Cities, which London is a part of, which ranges from New Orleans to London to Delhi. Lee's role is to ensure that through collaboration and a bottom-up approach, each community is influencing the top-level decisions that affect them, whilst also accessing high-quality sport programs that address the community's self-identified local issues. Renu, who is our, there she is, Thanks for joining us. Uh, Renu is a trained psychotherapist, an expert in community-based development programs in India, with 13 years of experience working the in the development sector with different target audiences on diverse themes such as HIV AIDS, health and nutrition, and sexual reproductive health. Renu leads Sport for Good in Simapuri, Delhi, ensuring that through collaboration, the community is driving change through sport. Renu also has a flair for sport, and as a volleyball player, she excelled as best sport woman of the year in her college. So it's good to have a sport, another sports person. We have a wrestler, didn't ask, oh, and basketball. So welcome to our volleyball player. And Lee, please join us. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about Sport for Good Cities. You've heard a lot about model cities, but it's also known as Sport for Good Cities. And uh, my colleagues here on the panel have set the scene nicely about what we're going to talk to today about bottom-up approaches and collaborative working. So I guess this is about showing you the how and going into the detail of how we make these things happen uh, around the world. Um, but just before I go into that, just a brief introduction into who Laureus are. Um, we are a NGO born 22 years ago under the patronage of a certain Nelson Mandela, uh, where we celebrate excellence in sport, but also celebrate the power of sport to change the world. Since the year 2000, we've uh, funded over 300 programs globally in over 50 countries, raising an estimated amount of 150 million euros with partners to be able to use sport for change. And as you can see, there's a certain Mr. Federer there who's very known on these shores, who's the person that's won the most awards in the history of the, of the, the awards. And as I said, we're, uh, the patronage that we're under is from Nelson Mandela, and it's uh, at the first Laureus World Sports Awards in Monaco in 2000, he did his speech talking about how sport has the power to change the world. And it's something which is basically Laureus's call to action with all our partners in the sector for sport for development to be able to change lives through the power of sport. So, Sport for Good Cities. This is an initiative which sits outside of Laureus's traditional grant making. Um, it's been running for the last 10 years. And essentially what it is, is a place-based funding approach where we, we started in New Orleans in the year 2014. And what we, do, what we did there is bring together a coalition of like-minded organizations and individuals to come together, facilitated by Laureus, managed on the ground by Laureus, to give them a platform to di dictate what the issues are that they're facing, 
um, and how and what solutions should they be using to, in order to change their community. So it's a bit it's a, a bottom up approach where decision making is given back to the community where Laureus is facilitating the process and transferring the funds, but the community is uh, using those funds as they wish with Laureus guidance. The diagram you can see there probably explains it better. So on the left side, you see the drop model, which is usually the way that funders work. Um, and it's the way that Laureus has worked in the past, where the funder will dictate what the issue is. Uh, they'll assume what the issues are. They'll bring a load of cash, dump it into the community. The community will apply for it without much consultation, uh, without much pushback, because the money is needed by those who are delivering the work. However, what we're trying to do is a scaffold approach on the side there, where you can see that the community is the house and Laureus is the scaffold, and we're providing the financing, the resources, the networking, but all ju just providing those, those uh, assets. And the community, as you can see here, they've highlighted that the top right of the house, the bathroom, needs renovating, so that's what the money's going to go towards. And that could be changed into an open space which wasn't used before, or something along those lines. Uh, we don't just deliver Sport for Good Cities in, in any city that we just rock up to. We have a, a process which I'll go into more detail, and we look to work into uh, areas which are a population of 50 to 100,000 people, districts or boroughs of a city, um, in order to make it happen. So currently we have Sport for Good Cities in uh, London and partnership with the GLA, and also in New Orleans, but all the way in Delhi and Hong Kong as well. Uh, we recognize that each city is very different, different challenges, different needs, but there's still a commonality of uh, an ambition to collaborate. There's community leaders in each city that want to come together who are not leaving their areas and want to make change sustainable through the power of sport. So just diving into the approach of how we create the Sport for Good City. So I mentioned that we work in a city by bringing together people and creating a steering group of like-minded uh, organizations or individuals, all focusing on the same goals to use their resources, whether it's human or financial, to put into one targeted location. And the reason why we do that is because if you put everything together, you'll more likely have a greater impact and you'll also have a long-term sustainable change in the long run. So the first phase before we ever even uh, work in the city is, is doing a desk-based research as well as research on the ground. So we do a lot of desk-based research to find out what the stats are in the community, what the issues are, what the needs are, but also what are the opportunities also. We also speak to young leaders, community leaders, the people that have been in the areas for since since beginning of time, um, who, who know the areas inside out. And we make sure that if we're going to do this program in the community, that it's not going to be dupli duplicating anything, that it's something that's going to be well received, and that there's an ambition to, to be able to be part of something through the power of sport. We then go to the strategy, the strategy phase where we work with the coalitions to create a strategy. So they've already identified what the needs are, what the issues are, but we go a bit more deeper than that and, and create a uh, monitoring and evaluation framework so they can have a theory of change developed for their particular area and they can measure success over the long run. The third one is pretty straightforward, which is just invest. So the money is there, the resources are all there. Laureus uh, brings in the funding, not just from Laureus, but also like-minded partners like the GLA and the coalition have already who have already uh, created their strategy, now know where the money should be going. So they are in the best place possible to assess applications for projects through, that use sport in order to change their community and that will hit their targets that the strategy has highlighted. And the fourth phase is around sustainability. And it's a buzzword which everyone throws around, but the end goal is not for Laureus to be there forever. Um, Laureus' do doors might close one day, but the whole, the whole aim is to make sure that the coalition that has been created can go on and become sustained in their own right, in their own name, uh, be able to draw down funds in their local community, and be able to continue the legacy of the program of bringing people together and making community-based decisions themselves. And I think we're going to go to Renu, who's going to talk about the impact of the work in Delhi and just bring it to life a little bit. So over to you, Radu. Thank you. Uh, namaste to all. Uh, my name is Renu and I'm looking after Laurier Sports for Good City in Delhi. As you can see, uh, Seema Puri is a rack pickers area and it's a highly crime-based uh, slum in Delhi. And 
there was no open space in the beginning of the program when we started all the area was choked with the garbage uh, boundaries of all open space were broken and was utilized as a dumping ground and no playground was available to play so as lee said with collaboration and bottom up with the local stakeholder we were able to create a bond and trust and adopted few parks in community renovated them uh, bring them to a level that they can be used for playing installed new cctv cameras with support of local stakeholders now the monitoring of these parks are being given to police uh, now the these areas are being taken as like space to play safe the bigger role is played by the local police as it's a high criminal crime based area and drug abuse area so police has played a very good role in supporting the program and bring the smile on the face of children and their continuous association is helping us to amplify the effect which we are doing in the community we have recently formed a new organization in the community which is led by local youth group from the collision network and they are doing the sensitization program and taking forward the sports based intervention in the community in those open areas which are available now for the play and there are many other organization formed by the local people who can understand what is the power of change and they want to bring the change to the community they want to now after a year of intervention uh, we have eight Uh, open grounds accessible for sports that is football uh, for all the uh, children we have uh, reached out to 2000 people in year children uh, we have 32 coaches with us who are delivering sessions in the community and we have reached out to almost 1100 sessions in the community we have 25 girls train in jiu jitsu which is martial arts we have Uh, one park adopted we have five children uh, which are being selected for national uh, sports camp these are the uh, recent achievements of our work in one and a half years and we are looking for many more collaborations and working in the community and bringing more change to to the community itself which has been driven by the local implementing partner local community Thank you. Right. Thank you, Renu. Uh, I think I might have gone over time. I had a couple more slides there, but um, just to round up. So you know, this work is is continuing, and and it's not Laureus's ambition to create a sport for good city or world domination uh, because that's not sustainable. Uh, there's another quick example on the slide there about our work in Chicago. and a case study of of the Chicago coalition which is made up of 85 NGOs sport federations um community leaders and they all came together to uh create a campaign called Chicago's comeback during covid in order to increase access to youth development based sports initiatives throughout the state of Illinois in Chicago and this resulted in a advocacy effort and turned into a 5 million dollar grant fund from the local government who were also involved So you know but power in numbers bringing people together can create more funding to sustain programs in the long run. And and in a quick summary of what Sports for Good Cities does do is obviously that legacy creation. It's a collaborative model but also a st- storytelling platform as you hear from Renu who talked about the impact of uh, the work in Delhi and how it's changed the community in the long run. And finally it's great to have the the project recognized by the World Health Organization as an initiative Uh, which is different to top down grant making and something we want to share with different cities and districts around the world to adapt to their model um and uh and and keep moving forward and uh thank you very much all right thank you very much i don't think we'll have too much time for questions unless there's perhaps a few burning ones out there any any hands or should i get it kick started All right, so we've heard a lot about how these projects begin, how you go in, you research in these communities, uh you find out what the issues are. I know you said you get to the real core of the issue. Um and it we have success stories in front of us. But what I'm curious, what are the challenges that you have faced in accomplishing these great projects? What are some of the key things that maybe cities out there might be facing and when they go back and they want to start a program, they say, "Okay, this is how I address this challenge." Um so 
Lee, would you like to get started? I think Mike should be on. Oh. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's uh, so many challenges with just community intervention. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we faced with Sport for Good Cities was encountering people that have just had enough of, of uh, policy in the area. They've had enough of politics. Uh, like I, s I mentioned in the presentation, the people that live in these communities where we work, they are forgotten communities and they've experienced neglect. Um, they've seen people come and go. They've seen people like a Laureus come and go. So their trust levels, when they see a Laureus come in and they Google us, they assume they're just going to go again. So the biggest challenge there was taking a lot of heat, mm -hmm. walking into rooms, sharing your ideas. And, and as good as it might sound, it's, it's still going to be flat out rejected. Uh, you're judged on what you do and not what you say. And in order to overcome that challenge, we just had to build a lot of trust and had to be present and had to take a lot of flack. Okay. Uh, but in the long run, it paid off. Excellent. Uh, anyone else? Um, I would say, well, similar to, to what Lee was saying, but from a, a kind of a city perspective, you know, we're, we're also sort of seen as the, doing the drop, what, yeah. what Lee was saying earlier, kind of swooping in, dropping some money, and then see you later, good luck. Um, which is obviously something that we're really pushing to get away from that that perspective. But yeah, as Lee was saying, we still have that, that viewpoint from a lot of community organisations, which is why it's really important for us that we're working with, with other funders, that we're bringing people together with grassroots organisations so they can really see that actually we want to know what is needed. We want to understand what's, what's going on in your community. Um, and that's a, a key role that we need to play as, as the GLA to bring those organisations together together and I would say as well another another <coughs> challenge can be when working with other funders um, our agendas can be very different um, and, uh, and sometimes when working with NGBs as well understandably NGBs uh, national governing bodies want um, enough as many people as possible to participate in their sport but for us it's more than participation so it's kind of getting a balance um, is, is difficult sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and just following up quickly on what you just said, <coughs> so you work with a lot of partners in the local areas. Is there a best way to connect with them? How do you identify the partners that you work with? Because I'm sure there's a lot of research maybe that goes into that or, or connections already that you have. Uh, Lauren or I mean, it yeah. looks like you have. Yeah, let me give you my feedback about the first question yes. first. Um, my first challenge was how, um, how sports can be converged or can tackle some social issues in my country, like education, gender equality, um, health, etc. Sports is not only playing a football game Sunday and winning a championship, which was the first challenge. Now, uh, we have more than 100 partners, so the challenge is how they can how can they be, you know, uh, partners for uh, long term? Because when you have a lot of partners, uh, each one want to be, you know, um, want to lead a program or want to have like more visibility than others. So this is the challenge. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's good to to work with many stakeholders from the government, from um, UN agencies, from um, diplomatic sections, uh, different embassies in uh, <laughs> Africa, but also private sector. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Anna, Maybe to, to add to, to, to this, I think that I, I see challenges at, at the two ends of the spectrum, right? I think that aligning at the beginning on what's the shared vision, what's the shared goal, and to your point, really identifying the people on the ground who knows what they need and taking the time to ask them, moving from the, you know, I know what you need to what do you need, and let's make sure that we all agree and align on that. And th this takes time. We should not undervalue this aspect. It can take, it can take months. <coughs> it could take even more to really align people on what is really important. And you need, to, you need people to put their guts on the table, right? Because it's not just, you, you, you want, very often you want to please the donor. So the donor has to... I would say put the mask down and say, I'm, I'm just one part of the coalition, so I'm bringing money, but you're equally bringing expertise, knowledge, network, and this is equally valuable. So I think that being on this, you know, I would say peer-to-peer -peer approach is, is, is critical, and it takes a lot of time. We should not undervalue that. That's why we recreate those safe spaces to create this, I would say, atmosphere. Okay. The other challenge I see is the sustainability aspect, because 
Once you know what you want to do, it's easy to make it run. You have obviously operational challenges, but how to sustain that and how to bring other partners who actually see the value in what you do. For instance, if you think of health, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we have a project in France, we are helping an organization that supports sports for elderly people. It's an organization that has uh, a lot of employees, but it, with a tiny budget, you know, and, and, and last year we, re we realized that what they were doing for elderly people, because they are preventing that those people break their hips or bones, etc. They were basically helping the health insurance system to save 1 billion euro uh, annually, based on those very simple sports activities that everyone could do. So suddenly you see that you could actually bring money from the outside, your little universe, by just creating the, the I would say, the understanding for other players that what you are trying to do and innovate about mm -hmm. can be fantastically impactful and cost efficient for the rest of society. And because we are so siloed in our world, I think that we need to create those spaces where we invite potential funders to see the interest in this type of project. I think that's a great, a great way to close it out, the selling point for our social innovation session, uh, showing the value of these great projects that you do, bringing them to the community, showing it to the different stakeholders, both within the community, but in the wider population as well. Maybe even here in Lausanne, the, the international federations and the broader sports communities, cities. Um, so thank you all for sharing all of that wonderful information. If Anyone has questions for them individually, I'm sure our panel will still be around this afternoon, so you can reach out to them privately. Um, and thank you, Francesco. Thank I know we're a little bit over time, me. and Renu, thank uh, you. It was great I mean, to have, first, a taxonomy, the courage of entrepreneurial mindset, research and policy, collaboration and community and cities. You are all representing platform for change. It's extremely important to have your contribution uh, in, in this challenge. I think it was Churchill who said, success is moving from failure to failure without, move, without losing enthusiasm. And you definitely show, you know, what sometimes failure means, but mostly, I mean, successes and the need for enthusiasm, the spirit, the entrepreneurial mindset, and what social innovation is all about. So thanks for your moderation, and thanks to the speaker.